And I think there are 30 stories in the book. Is that correct? Yeah. 30 learners for the book. What was the selection process? What was that like? How did you guys decide, you know what, we're going to have this person, but we're not going to have these people? Like, tell us more about that. Right. So we use what we call the duck test. Um, so oh, yes, yeah, that's the first, is... the beginning of the, the book. Yes, I remember yeah. that. <laughs> so if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it is a duck. Um, so basically, they <laughs> had, yeah, easy. <laughs> um, so sure, the idea sure. is, is that, well, I mean, for our purposes, it, it was a duck, right? Because so basically, um, the people that we took were people who could recount um, passing as a native speaker in their target language. Um, consistently um mm -hmm. for a, at least five minutes let's say mm -hmm. right um and not just one time so it can't be oh you were at your cousin's wedding and uh his mom said oh wow like where are you from in greece and actually you were from hungary mm -hmm. you know it, it has to be consistently by many different people right and so if there are any kind of doubts with that then we said okay no like if you can only really recount like two or three times maybe you're not what we're looking for, even though you're, that's great for you, you know? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then our other criteria was that they could not have spent an extended period of time immersed in the target language before mm. the age of 18. So that's taking out our critical period of hypothesis. Right. Mm. And they can't have had any heritage links. Oh. So Fascinating. Also related to the, the critical period hypothesis. So just making sure that they're not having any kind of early exposure in those traditional ways leo do you f are you a duck i think so i think so i think so i think i'm a duck yeah <laughs> but not i think the critical period got a little bit into me because okay. i went to i started when i was maybe nine ten I started at age six or seven with like listening to the bbc but i didn't understand much of what was said but uh, I, I found ways to stay in touch with the language, but I would say that most of my learning was um, incidental, wasn't really intentional. It was mostly consuming. So maybe I could have been in the book. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Maybe nice. next time. Maybe stories of exceptional <laughs> language teachers. Part, part, part two. Maybe we do a part two. Yes, yes. Um, it is one of the things I wanted to ask you, um, Katarina, is that I think you've mentioned this somewhere in the book or maybe in this conversation that we've been having, that even these successful language learners, they also dealt with these so-called shortcomings in their, for, in their second language. What is, I think the question is, can you help us understand, I mean, if you know the answer to this, what does it mean to to deal with these shortcomings in their second language? Um, and I, th I think you've mentioned something about linguistic limitations. Um, I think a word that I remember reading very clearly now was the word markedness. And perhaps you could shed a light on that. Right. So I think linguistic limitations and markedness aren't necessarily the same thing. Right. Um, markedness can be a limitation if for oh. some reason you were trying mm. to blend in um seamlessly with right. a group of people um yeah. so for example i'm very marked in nottingham because i have a very american accent exactly so i was gonna say that I like go, yeah and so everywhere i go people ask oh where are you from where are you from um and so and are you offended by that well it's interesting because so growing up in texas kind of how i started people always used to ask, where are you from, where are you from? And that was always because of my appearance or sometimes because of my name, but mostly it was because of my appearance. Right. Um, and sometimes it was a bit of both because I have a very white name and I don't look white. Um, <laughs> and so then moving here and people asking, where are you from? And they meant it the language wise. Yeah. Was just so, because, you know, then you respond, oh yeah, my mom's Indian, my dad's Greek. And they're like, no, but like, where's your accent from? Um, which I uh, just find, I, I feel like I should just give up. You know, it's, it's fine. There's nowhere that I can live where people <laughs> will just accept me as someone who exists. Right. Um, and so I very much kind of relate with that idea of mm -hmm. wanting to not be marked. Um, then on the other hand, so linguistic limitations would be 
you know, maybe not necessarily feeling like you can express yourself perfectly authentically all the time. Mm. Um, you know, or, you know, that work email that you were trying mm. to, to write, which, you know, you might have trouble in your first language as well, but maybe it adds an extra layer of difficulty because it's also your your second or third or fourth language. Um, yeah. Mm. So in, in passing this or in the word, you know, passing the, the test, the duck test, yeah. I guess, or so to speak, you know, markedness is either sounds like it's you have it or you don't. You know, it's, it's not something that you can, it's in your control. Um, proficiency though is, so is this something that, and it sounds like it's passing the test is in the hands of the receiver, mm. right? We talk a lot about with pronunciation teaching about it's a two way street. Sure. We can work on our own pronunciation, but it's also on the person to whom I'm speaking to meet me halfway or meet the learner or the student or whoever halfway is, am I understanding correctly that the interaction with the native like person determines the passing of of the test yes so there's i think so sorry <laughs> this is a, a bit confusing question um sorry yeah but, how i but, talk no, to somebody right. so, i so, ask yeah, a question the, and the their list... response to my question would indicate whether or not i i pass the test yeah so we basically the i think we these kinds of notions of, of nativeness in general and native likeness. Um, and I think a lot of people do write about this also have a lot of intersections with, for example, race, right? Mm -hmm. um, because we have this idea that, you know, certain languages align with certain races and things. And so, you know, your chances of passing um, for a language for which you don't look the part are a lot lower. And we do have um, some participants who talk about this as well. Um, so for example, I think Joy, um, you, I think she grew up in Brazil. So she's Canadian um, and she's blonde with blue eyes. Um, and she grew up in Brazil and she talks about how when she was a child, even though that, and this was during her critical period hypothesis, so not her native like language, but mm -hmm. Um, as a child, she was learning um, Portuguese and she sounded like a Portuguese person, but people would, there would be like a disconnect when she spoke with people because she didn't look the part. Yes. Um, but then later, as an adult, she moved to Iceland um, and learned Icelandic. And because she looked the part, she found it was a lot, she, she got a lot more leeway. Wow. There. Interesting. Right? Yes. That's... I identify with that. I, I mean, I speak Spanish and I'm the last person who looks like, like I had that <laughs> Guatemala. experience all the time where I would sit down. I'm you know, where I used to live in Costa Rica. So you'd go to a restaurant or a bar or something and you'd just start talking. And the person's face is like, I understand you. I had this conversation a hundred times. They were really like, very politely. I understand you perfectly, but what's coming out of your mouth doesn't, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> it doesn't match with the profile of person that I'm looking at. And it's, it's a very, interesting concept for sure i am reminded of that episode with dr jane setta andrew where she basically talks about a very similar story katarina i don't know if you if you know who jane setta is she is a prof where, where is she andrew i can't remember i have to pull up she's in england as well she's in the I uk remember, but i yeah. think university of reading i don't remember anyway yes, that's right is it Reading? I don't know. I have yes. to pull out the information here. But she talked a lot about in, in our episode with her when we talked about um, pronunciation. She said that her father really tried to help, like really try to kind of push her to change her accent because I think she came from a working class um, family in the UK and her father had to change his accent and she had to change her accent in order to be able to fit in. Because otherwise, she would have never been able, or he would have never been able to work at a bank. I don't remember exactly what it was. Something like but that. But I think it's a lot. And again, she's still a native speaker who still has to pass, right? As yeah. this is amazing. Actually, I think now that now that you mentioned this, I definitely listened to this podcast. Um, so yeah, <laughs> no, I mean, that and that's interesting, um, right? Because we have this idea of. When, when a language learner wants to sound native, like it's because they want to, they have this idea in their head of, they want to just exist in spaces where people have grown up speaking that language without being marked. Right. Mm -hmm. But what 
we don't take into account is that we also have these experiences in our first language as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think, you know, earlier, Andrew, you said that marketedness may not necessarily be something that we can change, but proficiency is. Um, I will kind of throw that back at you. Han, sure. Is marketedness something that we can't change, right? Um, I think to an extent, um, maybe, right? But, and I think a, a lot of the kinds of things that we see with pronunciation where we say, okay, after a certain age, people are just bad at learning pronunciation. But if we look at the history of pronunciation teaching, is it maybe also because we don't really teach pronunciation very much? Yes. You know, right? We're not giving people the opportunity to change. Yes. And you see this with, for example, with actors who are, they have voice coaches to. We talked about that in the accent. episode as well. Yes. And some yes. people do really, really well with it. Some people do terribly, like Emma Watson with an American accent. <laughs> really bad. So terrible. Um, bless her. She tried. She really did. Um, really, you know, great actor, actress. But yeah, the American accent was very strange. But other people do really, really well. Um, and so is the reason that we think that we can't change because we think so? Mm. Uh, because question. we just don't have the training? Yeah. Good question. 